Glory to God. I want to welcome everyone to another one of our studies and to the Word of God. We're, we're going to continue to study a lesson that we started a few weeks back. And the title of this lesson is Love, the Reason for Everything. And I, I wondered for many years why the scriptures, there was a scripture that says uh, in the New Testament, that you'll have no need for teachers because you'll know more than your teachers. You guys ever read that? Yeah, and then God set teachers in the church. Isn't that right? And he said, but you'll know more than your teachers. And it's very possible that you know more than this teacher. But right now you don't know more than the teacher who is the Holy Spirit. But as far as the worldly teachers, you know more than they do right now. Because they're still trying to figure out what this is all about. They're trying to figure out what life is all about. You have your philosophers, and it says in 1 Corinthians, the Lord called, let's, let's go there and read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, we'll start reading in verse 18. It says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Verse 20, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer's? the disputer of this world. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Let me read that in the Amplified Bible. It says, where is the wise man, the philosopher? Where is the scribe, the scholar? Where is the investigator, the logicians, the, the logicians, the debater of this present time and age? Has not God shown up the nonsense and the folly of this world's wisdom? Oh boy, and how many of us just hang on to what the world is saying? Isn't that something? He said, that's foolishness. You know more than your teachers. They're still trying to figure out what it's all about. Love. The reason for everything. And it's such an uh, easy-to-understand lesson. But it's hard to hold on to because of your debaters. And, and there has to be more than this. And your scientists, or what the Bible calls your so-called scientists, don't let them confuse you. You know what it's about. You know the reason for everything, and the reason is love. And I just praise God and thank Him for the fact that He drew this out in His Word so that we, people, I shouldn't say we, you might not be in this group, but people like me with a low IQ could figure it out, could understand it. <laughs> See, he said, he said, speaking to me, He said, I made it so simple even a fool like you can get it. That's what he said. Now he was speaking to me, he wasn't speaking to you guys. <laughs> he knew that I would be foolish enough to know, I, I don't know this, I can't figure it out, so I'm going to have to rely on this word. You want to know why I go to the word so much? I don't have any wisdom outside of this word. I was a fool going someplace to do something foolish and someone shared this word with me. Praise God. Thank God. And without this word, I'm still the same big old fool. But I rely on this word. 
It says it's the love of God that constrains me. What are we teach, being taught about right now? The love of God, the fact that God is less. It's not my willpower that keeps me from doing those foolish things that I was doing before. It's knowing how much God loves me. It hurts me when I mess up because I know it hurts him. That's what the man said this morning, wasn't it? Because he loves me. Doesn't it hurt you if, if, if someone you love does something that hurts themselves? You don't want them to hurt themselves. You say kids, is that, what, what, is that the word kids? <laughs> right, it just popped out of her mouth. She wasn't even talking to me, it just popped out of her mouth. You love your children and you don't want them hurting themselves, doing something to hurt themselves because it hurts you. Well, God loves you. He doesn't want you doing or me doing the foolish things that I was doing because it hurts me. And that's what hurts him. So because of that profound love that he has toward me, I want you to understand this. It's not my love toward God that constrains me. It's his love toward me that keeps me straight. And then in, what is that, uh, Titus 2.11? Is that Titus 2, 11, the grace of God, for the grace of God teaches us? So I've got the love of God to constrain me and the grace of God to teach me how to live right. It's by grace, because if he treated me according to my works, lightning wouldn't have had to strike. <laughs> It would have just been a big explosion. What caused it? <laughs> oh, my. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. It's all about love. It says, where is the dispute? Where is the wise man, the philosopher? Where is the scribe, the scholar? Where is the investigator, the logician? The debater of this present time and age, has not God shown up the nonsense and the folly of this world's wisdom? Any of you that are like to just follow things and, and see and let God teach you, go to, go to Google and just Google the word, the God particle. The God particle. That's what scientists, the debaters, the philosophers, this is what they're looking for. They're looking for the God particle. You see, they, 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 they know God, the expanse of the universe, right? So they spent billions and are still spending billions of dollars. They, they probably spent enough money trying to get to the God particle to desalinate enough ocean water to irrigate the planet. But they're spending time doing what? Searching for the God particle. Well, you know what the God particle is? It, it, it's in a sense trying to get something that if you can think and picture this, like this piece of paper, can it be split? It can be split. I mean, there are things that they could use to split this. And then when you split that, you would have two of these that were smaller than this, right? Could you split them? Well, see, they're trying to get to the place where they can split something that is so thin, it's only one-sided. That's the great minds of the world. Can anything be split so thin that it's only one-sided? Hmm? That, that, that... No, we could debate this, couldn't we? Where are your debaters? Come on, well, let's debate this. This is what they're looking for. This is what the scientific world is looking for. If you think I'm lying, Google it. They're trying to find an atom, a, not an atom, 
an electron, not an electron, a part of an electron. See these atom smashers and things, they keep building them bigger and faster and making it so the things will go at a greater speed and they keep thinking that if they collide it, it's going to explode, it's going to break up, it's going to break apart and they can take and they can measure it. And they'll get down to something that is so thin it's only one-sided. And that would be the God particle. You guys are aware of the atom smashers and the electrons and all of those things that they're doing? They've already come up with a premise. They've come up with a premise of something that you can check out. Now this is the premise. That an electron you guys all went to school, right? You know what an atom looks like? What does an atom look like? It has a nucleus, right? And what's going around the nucleus? Electrons are going around the nucleus. Well, what happened to scientists, see the philosophers, the debaters, the educated people, educated in the things of the world and not the things of God, they look at this electron and they tell you the qualities of this electron. And the electron is, or, or let's see, how can I say this? It's so nonsensical. It's two of one thing. Not one of two things, it's two of one thing. It's both a particle, something that has mass, something that is physical, and it's a wave which is nothing but energy. You know, like a sound wave? It has no particle, it has no substance. A sound wave is going all through this building right now. We go turn on the radio, and, and what would we do? We pick up radio signals, radio waves. Do they originate when we turn on the radio? No, they're going through all through everything right now. Through walls, they have no physicality. So the electron that you saw, that they taught you about in school, forget it. This is what the scientists have found. That an electron is both a particle, which is physical, and a wave, which is energy. Two separate and distinct things. It is both of them at the same time. Now listen to the last part of this. This is what they discovered from looking at it and seeing it. It's both a wave and it's a particle if it exists at all. <laughs> I know this sound, doesn't this sound like nonsense? Check it out. Check it out for yourself. They look at this, I'm talking about the Word of God, if you guys don't know it, I know you think, well, he's really off on, no, I'm not off on a tangent. The Holy Spirit wants you to pick up on something. This particle that they call the electron, that is both a wave and are a particle, exists, one single electron exists in more than one place at a time. Now they've done this through mathematics. One, did you hear what I'm saying, one? One electron has the ability to exist in one, in, in two places at the same time. Two distinct places at the same time. Mathematically they figured it out that if you have that electron, it's only one of them, if you have it over here and you have it over here at the same time, if you Tickle this one, this one will laugh. But here's something really interesting. It'll laugh instantly. If they're the furthest distance you can get apart in the universe. That means that this whatever is traveling between this electron, not electrons, electron, is traveling faster than the speed of light. That takes light thousands of years to travel those great distances of space. 
Now, all of this that I just shared with you is not new stuff. This was back in the 1930s when Einstein was, 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 was in Planck and some of these other great uh, uh, quantum physicists were putting forth this thing. It was so engrossing to them that they had a conference to discuss whether or not there was a God. These, these atheists, these people who didn't believe in God, they got together because they couldn't understand it. They get an electron telescope, they get two of them, and I'm looking in this one, and you're looking in this one, you say, well, where's the electron? I say, it's at 9 o'clock. You say, no, it's at 2 o'clock. We're both looking at one electron at the same time, but we both see it in different places. So they came to the conclusion that the electron, see, one might be seeing a particle, the other one might be seeing a cloud. They came to the conclusion that when they were looking at it, it was looking at them. Now, let's say, well, what does this have to do with the Word of God? They're looking at God's Word. Think about it. And God said, what He said was what? Created what? A sound wave. It created sound. And God said, let there be dry land, and the sound, which is a wave, became a particle, which is earth. See, they want to deny God. This is why they had to get together and ask among themselves, is there a God? And then according to the book of Hebrews, when you get the reading in Hebrews, where someone know what chapter and verse that is, where it says the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword? 4.11? Let's go over there. See, I'm talking about the word of God. I'm talking about the fact that love is the reason for everything, and God is love. Hebrews chapter 4. And verse 12. For the word of God is quick. You know what that means? It's alive. His word is alive. His word is so alive that his word has a name. Huh? Jesus. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among... What became flesh? The Word. The Word. A Word is a vibration. It is something spoken. It creates a vibration. And the vibration became a particle. It became flesh. They're looking at... They have found... They don't know it. They have already found the God particle. It's Jesus. It's the Word of God. They want to know the reason for creation. And they make up alligator people and people from this galaxy or that galaxy. They make up all of this foolishness. That's why he says that stuff is foolishness, church. It's really unfortunate that our universities that were started by the church are now being run by people who don't even want you to mention the word God on the campuses. Why? Satan had to get the word out of the schools. But this doesn't stop here. What they say when they're looking at it, it's looking at them. Let's read on. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the moral, and is a discerner. What does that mean, it's a discerner? Huh? It can think. When they're looking at it, it's looking at them. It's deciding whether it wants to be a particle or a wave. God is omnipresent. That's why if you tickle him over here, you're tickling him over here too at the same time. Isn't that what they're saying? They can be in two places at once. They're talking about God. They're describing God to, to the world and they don't even know it. That's why that scripture says, where are your philosophers? Where are your debaters? Where are your wise men? It says, come on, bring them on. 
He said, I've made the wisdom of this world as foolishness unto God. Plain old everyday foolishness. It's either here or it's there, it's either a particle or a wave, if it exists at all. Isn't that what they're saying? There's no God who we're looking for, the God particle? Come on, you guys realize what, what, what Satan is doing. Let's read a little bit further, though. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and the marrow, and as a discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. I thought we were talking about a word. In his sight? Wonder why they think that this that they're looking at is looking at them. As a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. If you go and read their papers, they say it's like it knows what you're thinking. This electron that they're trying to describe. When we look at it, it's like it knows what you're thinking and it reacts to what you're thinking. A, a discerner of what? The thoughts and intents of the heart. What do you intend to do with this information about God? You see him speaking that to the one looking in the microscope? I'm revealing myself to you right now as a wave, a word. And God said, and he saw, and he said, and he saw. You know more than your teachers. You at least know that love is the reason for everything. If, 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 if this goes all the way into God's very purpose. See, this is what an adult does. He, he, he gets to a point where he stops looking just at his own need. The child wants daddy, mommy, give me, give me, fix me, do me, do this. Isn't that right? And then as they start growing up, they get, well, I don't know if I believe in God. I'm kind of an ag agnostic. And, you know, I really don't because I'm, you know, I've been to school. And, you know, since going to school, I don't know. I'm very, I'm very. And then you get a little older and you say, yeah, hey, Dad, uh, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm fixing. Can I help you? This happens in the church. When you get to the point you want to say, Father, what are you doing? What you see, we, we confess this for how many years? We're co-laborers with him. Co-laborers with him. We're a supernatural church. We're co-laborers with him, not for him. He doesn't need us to do anything for him. He, yes. You think you're going, well, they wondered. They wonder. They're looking at something they can't explain. They're explaining something they don't know about. But we know. See, it, the, I'm going to give it to you and then I'm going to close. we got about four or five minutes. Just going to give you the synopsis. Remember I told you I was going to tell you the end from the beginning. Love is the reason for everything. God is love. God has a son. How many gods are there? Turn to Isaiah chapter 6. I think it's 6. We'll see right quick. God made something uh, that we know that we call and we've turned some things are synergistic. That's two things that make each other stronger. You and I can get together and working together, we can make each other stronger because you have your strengths, I have my strengths, and working together we can do things that we couldn't necessarily do apart. You got the idea of the synerg synergism? In Isaiah, maybe it's 9... 
9, Isaiah 9, 6. Not chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It says, For unto us a child is born. Who is that? Jesus. Unto us a son is given. Who is that? Now, that's not talking about Jesus. It's talking about God the Son. God the Father, God the, the, God the Son exists before Jesus existed. Yeah, Jesus became, the Word became flesh a couple of thousand years ago. But God the Son was with the Father in the beginning. You see, this talking about the Word being made flesh. But I, I can't go too deep into that right now. A point here that I want to share with you before we close. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. Wait, 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 wait. His name was referring to whose name? The Son's name. And Jesus' name. But what, this is kind of stepping into someone else's territory. Isn't this stepping into the Father's territory? Isn't God the Father? And Jesus the Son? So is Jesus the Father, is Jesus the Son? I mean, come on, you guys, this is a little simple scripture you guys have been knowing for years. I know you've meditated on it, right? That's right, they're one. They're synergistic. They're all working toward one purpose and one goal. You, you, you hear Jesus preaching before he went to the crucifixion? For he's preaching to the church that they might be all one in us as we are one? You and me and me and you? And them and us? This is... This is talking about what everything is about. Love. The love of the Father for the love of the Son. And a love that is so strong and so binding that they are one. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Didn't, didn't he say that? They, the, his disciples, his believers, like this group of believers, they said, show us the Father, and that will be sufficient. You, Jesus, aren't sufficient unto us. Think of what he's saying. He said, there will be sufficiency unto us if you show us the Father. In other words, we know what you said, we know what you've taught, but that's not enough. Pastor, that's not enough. Show us the Father. And he said, have I been with you so long and you've not known me? Was he talking about them not knowing Jesus? They didn't know the Father. And he said, I'm with you. But this is, I want to get to this point. It says, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. Jesus' name is the everlasting. Well, wait a minute, I thought God was the, but then God is, I'm confused, Pastor. I don't know who's who and what's what. No, you do know who's who and what's what. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and you. You, He loves so much that He wants you to be just like Jesus because he loves Jesus so much. He wants you to be just like Jesus because Jesus loves him so much. That you, him, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, guess what? You're all one. I said the purpose for everything is love. And we're gonna close on one scripture. It'll be about three minutes over. God, created you in the beginning God created everything and he said let us make man what 
in our own image and in our own likeness. Isn't that what he said? Now he is speaking to someone. He said, let us, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, all in counsel. He said, let us create man in our own image and our own likeness. Jesus is the expressed image of the invisible God. So if man was going to be created in the image of God, in whose image would he be created? In the image of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. He wants you to be so much like Jesus that this profound love that he has for Jesus, he's poured into you. And he's already done it. Here again, you don't have to do anything. This is where we started. This has already been done. The love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by who? By the Holy Spirit. He's not trying to get God's love into you. He's already got God's love into you. He just hasn't gotten you out of your body yet. You are not your body. You are a spirit. Yes. Of his fullness we have received. We have all received. It says of his full and his fullness dwells in us bodily. That's what we're last week we're talking about. How do you get a hundred pounds of potatoes into a five pound bag? You're bigger on the inside than you are on the outside. Only God could do that. But you get this picture. God is pouring all of his love into his son. And his son in return, does what? Pours all of his love back into God. They're synergistic. And God said, Oh, if I could have and receive more of this love. And Jesus said, If, if I could just receive more of your love to give back to you. Now we'll close with this scripture and you can meditate. I can't teach on the meaning of it because we're out of time. But go to Romans chapter 8. Love, the reason for everything. It's the reason for your existence. It's the reason for the existence of the universe. We're going to read. We'll read for the, for, to keep it in some context. We'll start reading in verse 27. We came over here for verse 29. It said, And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know. See, this is something we're supposed to know. And we know all things work together for good for them that love God. There's that love. To them who are called according to his purpose. What's your purpose, Father? What are you doing? called according to his purpose. If you don't know what his purpose is, you don't know what your purpose is. That's why you know more than your whole, all your teachers. You know the purpose of God. And he talks about it right here. Verse 29, this is why we came over. For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, the image of his son, who's the son the image of? The image of the father. And you're to be in the image of the son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's the reason for everything. God is growing a family. We're the family. You guys heard this before, right? We're the family of God. We're the children of God. What purpose did he want all of these children for? Because they're just like Jesus. We were predestined. You were predestinated to be just like Jesus. What is Jesus doing? He said, I only do what I see my father do. Well, what do you see your father doing, Jesus? What is your father doing? He said, my father's building a house. Isn't that good? He said, and I love my father so much that he lives in me. And he's going to live in all my brethren. And he said, and I love him so much that I want him to have a house that is bigger than all of creation. Think about it. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. 
For in my Father's house are many mansions. Not on my Father's land. Inside of his Father's house there are many mansions. And God said, you are a holy tabernacle. You're being built up a holy tabernacle that I will reside in and live in forever. And the Holy Spirit, he said, I'll second that. He said, for I'll never leave them nor forsake them. And what you are right now is being built into that holy tabernacle that God has designed to live in throughout all of eternity, pouring out his endless love on you. And the only thing he says is, understand, receive my love, because there's a day coming that I will do to you what I did to Jesus. Jesus said, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with you before the beginning of the world. And that's what he's going to do. Return all of the glory that Jesus gives to his Father. Didn't he always give glory to God? I, I just say the words, my Father. Oh, my Father. He does the work. That's my Father. Father, I know you hear me. Father, he always, and the Father speaks down and says, that's my beloved Son. And him, I am well pleased. Oh, Father, I love you. Oh, Jesus, I love you. For all of eternity going from one transcendent level of glory to another never to cease. But we're going to cease this lesson right now because we're well over time. Glory to God. We'll continue this next week.